Hi, welcome to the video tutorial 9 Reasons to Try Scala. This tutorial is for intermediate level Java developers, and developers in other languages too, who are curious about what the big deal is with the Scala programming language. We will look at 9 compelling features of Scala that will hopefully impress you and inspire you to explore both the language itself and its applications. So let's get started. The files used in this tutorial are available on GitHub with the link provided. Please download them if you'd like to follow along. Kind of like Brangelina and Kimye, Scala gets its name by combining the word scalable language because it is designed to grow with your needs from a few lines in the console to major enterprise applications. Scala source code gets compiled in a bytecode that runs on the Java virtual machine, so it is generally interoperable with the Java language. Like Java, Scala is object-oriented, but like Haskell, Scala is also functional with a powerful static type system. Scala has actually been around a lot longer than you might think. It has been publicly available since 2004, but over the last several years, it has gained enough traction to motivate many prominent open source projects and even to drive the evolution of Java itself. Why is that? Let's dive into some code and see for ourselves, but keep in mind it is more important to understand the big picture than every little detail. There's plenty of time for that later. In his legendary book, Effective Java, Josh Plock has an item called Minimize Mutability. He suggests you should make sure objects are impossible to change after they're instantiated. In Java, this means doing things like using final, avoiding setter methods, and making copies of mutable objects at collections and dates. Why do this? Think about how much time you've spent on a debugger trying to figure out where a variable changed and caused a bug that forced you to work on the weekend. Immutable values don't change, so things get a lot simpler, especially in a multi-threaded environment. Like other functional languages, Scala makes immutability a priority and encourages you to write immutable code. Here we do pretty much the simplest thing possible, initialize a value. We just use the keyword val and that's it. If we try to change the value of initial val, we get an error at compile time. This is a lot better than relying on the discipline of developers to use language constructs like final in Java or freeze in Ruby, or just hoping for the best in Python. Astute viewers might also notice that we didn't declare a type. Scala is strongly typed, but it also offers type inference. It just figures out that initial val is an int. This is one of many ways that Scala is more concise than Java. One last point on immutability. When developers in most languages want to assign the result of a long-running function to a variable, they typically initialize it to a default value and then update it later with the result of that long-running function when they need it. For the sake of performance, you don't have to do that with Scala. Here we initialize random numbers with the result of a long-running function. Adding lazy here means that the function doesn't execute until we actually use random numbers as we do here. So you get the performance benefit of laziness without compromising immutability. That's pretty cool. Another cool feature of Scala is traits. A lot of Java developers see traits as nothing more than Scala's version of Java interfaces. If you just use them that way, you are really selling yourself short. C++ allows multiple inheritance, which is great for infusing a class with lots of different kinds of behavior, but it can get pretty messy. Java goes to the opposite extreme by forbidding multiple inheritance, but allowing multiple interfaces with no behavior. Traits in Scala split the difference. Our school person trait models anyone involved with the school students, faculty, administrators, guest lecturers, and so on. It looks a lot like an ordinary Java interface with two methods, name and salary. Then we extend school person to student and teacher by implementing salary. Because they have implementations, Java would consider these abstract classes, but they're still traits in Scala. The trait sluggable models any object that can be represented with a slug on the web, like a blog post. It is a protected implementation and a public method. Again, not an abstract class. Finally, we get to have some fun. A teaching assistant is both a student and a teacher, and mixes in both traits with sluggable, so it has the behavior of all three. This is similar to how modules are used in Ruby. You might have one question. Where does teaching assistant implement the name method it inherits from school person? In Java, we have to write our own boilerplate get name method, but Scala gives us the equivalent for free because name is in the constructor. That's how we implement the name method. If you are really clever, you might have a second question. If student and teacher both inherit their name and salary methods from school person, and teaching assistant inherits from both of them, does teaching assistant use students or teacher's name and salary implementations for itself? This is the famous diamond problem that C++ endures and Java avoids altogether. Scala solves this by moving right to left to break the tie. In this case, because teacher is on the right, teaching assistant uses the methods and inherits from teacher, as you can see from the salary. We can also use traits to really take advantage of Scala's type system to avoid errors at runtime. Let's model staff authorized to use the software that maintains student grades. If we decide only teachers get to use the grading system, 
we can create this trait grading system user. Notice this reference to teacher. Groovy developers might recognize this as a self-type, and it locks grading system user so we can only mix it into instances of teacher. So we have no problem mixing grading system user into computer science teacher because that is an instance of teacher. But we have a big problem when we try to mix grading system user into computer science student. The compiler won't let us. The self-type doesn't have to be a trait. It can even be just a method signature. Trait coach is typed to any class that has a method called sports, returning a collection of strings representing the names of the sports he or she coaches. Our football coach class does just that, so we can mix in the coach trait just fine. The random person class does not have such a method, so the compiler complains. Traits combine the power of C++ multiple inheritance, the simplicity of Java single inheritance, and the flexibility of Ruby mix-ins. If you write code in Scala, use them. Case classes are another popular feature of Scala. We've already seen that promoting immutability and reducing boilerplate are big priorities for the language. Case classes epitomize that. Case classes are just like regular Scala classes, except they come prepackaged with the implementations for equals, hash code, toString, and all your getters. All the boilerplate code Java developers have been sick of writing for a long time. Here we have a superhero case class constructed with a name, a company, and an optional from Earth parameter that defaults to true. Under the hood, there is a singleton companion object also called superhero, which acts like a Java class with only static methods. The companion object has a factory method called apply with the same signature. Just for fun, we have an additional apply method for our case class to provide an overloaded constructor that only takes a name. Creating instances of superhero is really straightforward, but the apply method under the hood means we don't need to use the new keyword, syntactic sugar for the win. Also notice that the built-in equals method works as promised. Case classes are immutable by default. If I want to change a value, rather than go back and make it mutable, I can call the built-in copy method with the field I want to change and the desired new value. All of this might seem merely convenient, but case classes are much more than that. They're great for mapping objects to entities in your backend database. For the mathematically inclined, case classes are the basis for algebraic data types in Scala. Even if you aren't mathematically inclined, you can get a sense of why that matters when you look at extractors and pattern matching. Let's loop through a collection of superheroes and pick a random superhero in each iteration. We use a match expression to extract information from the superhero instance. Remember those apply methods that take components and assemble them into a case class instance? There are corresponding unapply methods that do the opposite, take the instance and disassemble it to its components. Those work under the hood to allow us to match on case class instances and do whatever we want with the pieces. Here we pull out the name and the company without caring where the superhero is from and print out that information. We can even extract from collections. We shuffle the list of superheroes and match on the list to extract the first element, typically called the head of the list, while disregarding the tail. And because the head is a case class instance, we can go deeper and extract from that as well. It's like the movie Inception. We drill down into the shuffled list to extract the head element, and then drill into that to extract the superhero's name and company while then matching on the company to take action depending on which one it is. Together, extractors and pattern matching are an elegant and flexible way to apply the functional equivalent of the visitor pattern in object-oriented languages. The mathematically inclined might also recognize that cases and match expressions are partial functions. Another prominent place where extractors and pattern matching are useful is with option. Option is the functional way to solve one of the worst programming problems, the existence of null. Even the guy who invented it called it his billion dollar mistake. Developers in Haskell, Swift, and even Java developers who use Google Guava are probably already familiar with the notion of optional types, but let's see how it works in Scala. We have a simple employee case class, and we add a bunch of employees to a vector. Then we define a findById method that uses vector's find method to look for an employee with the given ID. When there is no employee with the given ID, some Java developers throw a checked exception. That forces you to handle that case at compile time, which is more productive, but using exceptions for control flow is generally a bad idea. Other developers return null, but that demands that everyone on your team has the discipline to add the boilerplate null check everywhere or risk debugging null pointer exceptions at runtime, because that's fun. Instead, in our Scala code, we return an option employee indicating we may or may not have a hit. Option is an abstract class that has two subclasses, sum and none. Sum is a case class that acts like a one item collection. It holds a value if there is one. None is a singleton object representing the absence of a value. In our loop, we pick a random ID from 0 to 9. Since our employee IDs range from 1 to 5, we will get some hits and some misses. We can use a match expression to unpack whichever we get. If we get a hit, the result will be a sum employee. 
and we can use the extracted employee value to do anything. If we miss, the result will be none. This is a type safe way to handle both cases at compile time without an awkward exception. As cool as match expressions are, they aren't the most idiomatic way to handle option. It is more elegant to handle option like a collection. Actual collections let you map a function to each element to transform it into a new value in a new collection. Here we rewrite our original code to handle option employee more idiomatically. We map the employee object inside to a string and fetch the result with get or else. Of course, this only happens if the option is a sum employee. If it is none, we skip map and get or else returns the default value. Now let's say you're working on backend form validation in a web application where we want to treat meaningless strings, empty or white space only strings, like none, so we can validate mandatory fields. We can take advantage of the collection-like nature of option to do that. Here we have a collection of option string, a sum holding a useful string, none, and a sum holding an empty string. We pick a random option value, but instead of map, we filter. We typically associate filter with collections, where it removes all elements from the collection that don't pass the condition. Option offers an analogous filter that returns none if the value inside the sum doesn't pass the condition. Here we filter out any string inside the option that has nothing left after trimming whitespace. Some video passes the test and gets passed along to the end. None skips filter right to the get or else default. Some empty string gets the filter but doesn't pass the test. This returns none that also results in the get or else default. Option provides a concise type safe way at compile time to handle the presence or absence of values without having to explicitly check. This functional approach is elegant and seen with other Scala classes like try and either you may wish to explore. Now let's look at the power of implicits. Implicits are a big topic in Scala, but let's focus on implicit conversions. Implicit conversion provides a fairly simple way to add functionality to existing classes. Let's say employee and teacher were developed independently, but we wish to blend them so that we can consider all the teachers to be employees. We write a function with the keyword implicit indicating how to convert an instance of teacher to an employee. After we create a computer science teacher, we can of course call the methods it inherits from teacher but notice we can also call the title method it now has via implicit conversion to employee, and we didn't have to touch the teacher or employee object model to do it. This approach is a lot easier than the cumbersome boilerplate necessary to implement the decorator pattern in Java, or the confusion that can arise from monkey patching in Ruby. This enrich my library or pimp my library pattern comes in handy often like when you want to integrate legacy libraries with new code. Just like the decorator pattern in monkey patching, implicit conversion is not without disadvantages. It is a major part of the core language, but with great power comes great responsibility. Speaking of the core language, the ability to write high-performance code that takes advantage of all the cores in your machine is built right into Scala. You know hardware is getting more and more powerful, but those cores go to waste if the software doesn't utilize them. Scala makes this easy. We create a collection of 2,000 random numbers, and we perform two operations on this data structure, a map and a filter. You can figure out how many processors are available to the JVM by calling runtime.getRuntime.AvailableProcessors. And to divide work among them, just call the par method on the collection. This returns a parallel collection with the same semantics as conventional collections, so you can perform the same operations you always would. A collection generally needs to have at least several thousand items for you to notice a performance gain from parallelizing operations, but the capability is there, and it's easy. Parallelization in Scala isn't just limited to data structures. It took a while, but performance and scalability have finally become first-class citizens in application development. The key is to write asynchronous, non-blocking code where long-running operations like database accesses or REST calls to public APIs can execute in parallel with other code. Eventually, we get notified the operations are complete and act on the results. Node.js is a popular technology that was among the first to make this programming model easier for developers. Scala uses Future to do the same thing. This aptly named long-running function could take a while, and we don't want to wait around for it to finish, so we use future. Future looks a lot like option in that it holds a result, in this case a future of a sequence, and offers collection semantics like map and filter, but future is a placeholder for a value. You can't do anything with the result until the operation is over and the result exists. Here we use map to declare what we want to do with the result when the future completes. Take the first 50 numbers from the list and filter out the odd numbers. Keep in mind in real life, you should almost never do this await thing, because it blocks execution until the result comes back and totally defeats the purpose of future. But it's helpful for the console, unit tests, and our video tutorials. The coolest thing about futures is how easy it is to chain them. Here we execute two long-running functions simultaneously and then work with both results as soon as they're ready. We can use flat map and map to get at the sequences inside the futures to produce a final result list with the original list spliced together.
Experienced functional programmers will be comfortable with this approach, but for those who may find it hard to keep track of the call chain, Scala offers syntactic sugar for the same thing. You can use a for comprehension to unpack the results and work with them as needed. The two are equivalent, just depends what you're comfortable working with. Hopefully Future and all the other nice features of the Scala language you've seen have convinced you to give it a try. But there is one more thing to consider that has nothing to do with code. Like all programming languages, Scala isn't perfect. Its strong type system, powerful features, and combination of object-oriented and functional paradigms make the learning curve steep. Compilation can be slow because of features like type inference and implicits. You can even find binary compatibility errors if the versions of Scala vary between compile time and runtime. But for all these bumps in the road, Scala has become pretty popular. With Scala, you can build web applications with Play Framework or Lyft. You can build a REST API layer with Spray or Scalatra. You can connect to a relational database with Slick, Anorm, or Scalic JDBC. You can connect to MongoDB in a non-blocking, streaming way with Reactive Mongo. You can write JavaScript in Scala with Scala.js. You can build Android applications with Scaloid or Macroid. You can build high-performance, concurrent applications in a distributed environment with Akka. You can even jump on the big data analytics bandwagon with Apache Spark. These are just a few of the major open source frameworks and tools available in Scala. No one knows what the future holds and how big Scala will get, but no matter what happens, Scala will allow you to create awesome applications in basically any domain you want. Let's summarize. Scala is an object-oriented and functional programming language inspired by Java, Haskell, and other languages. It has a lot of powerful features that make it a joy to work with. These include first-class support for immutability that makes code simpler, traits that mix functionality into classes, case classes that save you boilerplate and serve as algebraic data types, extractors and pattern matching that provide an easier version of the visitor pattern, the option class which allows us to forget about null once and for all, implicits that allow us to extend functionality transparently, parallel collections that allow us to distribute operations to all available cores in our machine, and futures that enable us to perform long-running tasks in parallel and handle their results asynchronously. These features are so compelling that many of them have driven the evolution of Java. Most importantly, Scala isn't just some experimental toy language that is fun to play with in the garage but lacks any practical value. In fact, Scala has become the language of choice for many leading frameworks in areas ranging from web applications to mobile development to big data. If you haven't already, don't forget to download the files using this tutorial from GitHub and explore the code for yourself. You will never learn technology listening to someone talk. Getting your hands dirty is the only way to do it. We really hope you enjoyed this tutorial and became interested enough in Scala to try it out for yourself. Scala is a rich language with a lot of terrific features, and we will explore many of them in greater detail in future tutorials and blog posts on the video website. We hope you will check those out too. Thanks for watching. This has been 9 Reasons to Try Scala by Vidya.